So today in our series of DocPlex's Cable interview, we have with us uh, Professor Sean Kihoy, uh, an eminent international uh, gynecological oncologist uh, who is a Lozentate Professor of Gynecological Cancer uh, in, in the Institute of Cancer and Genomic Sciences, uh, University of Birmingham. Uh, Dr. Kihoy has uh, cared for thousands of patients with the whole spectrum of precancerous and cancerous conditions over more than 20 years and continue to do so in his present workplace, uh, City Hospital in Birmingham. He has lectured widely, both nationally and internationally. His research interest involves ovarian cancer and the understanding of malignant changes which occur during the therapy. He has also played uh, the role of investigator in several clinical trials. Um, thank you, Dr. Kohe. Uh, the first question I would like to ask you, that is it true that the number of gynecologists trained in gynecological oncology is lacking all over the world? It is indeed, because there's only a few thousand available. And we estimate in the UK that you probably need two gynecologists per million population or thereabouts. So for the UK, at this moment, after over 20 years, we've probably reached that level. Okay. And if you extrapolate that around the world, it's probably about the same type of figure. So as we only have a few thousand people who are trained in gynae oncology around the world, there is a deficit in these specifically trained people, so there's no doubt about that. Uh, most Western type countries are now getting to a stage whereby they may well have sufficient gynae oncologists, but even then, uh, not sufficient in many places. So what kind of the reason for it? It's probably due to the fact that in our college there was a recognition of a need for subspecialties in obstetrics and gynaecology and therefore in the late 80s they decided that this should be developed as an educational and training program and therefore it's a specifically recognized training program looking towards the future. So they're quite innovative. In the United States they already had these type of programs in place but in many places in Europe for example they still do not have proper programs running but are developing them uh, as they go along. So okay. it's probably obstetrics and gynaecology being so large compared to the small area of gynae oncology that it takes time for countries and institutions to accept uh, specific training programs. Okay. So what motivated you to be in the gynecological oncology? That was just one of those areas that you follow if you feel it's what you want to do <laughs> and I took an interest in gynecological cancers through my experiences and my training in obstetrics and gynaecology and made a decision that that's where I'd like to go. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, so according to you, how important is screening in reducing the morbidity and mortality due to ovarian cancer? How should be the effective screening strategy? What should be the strategy of screening? Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have an effective screening strategy. Uh, there's no evidence to date to show that screening a woman for a suspected ovarian cancer or screening, sorry, the general population, that any screening program actually works. So we are in a bit of a dilemma uh, in what we are going to do with regards to screening. So, so far the evidence that we do have is actually against screening the population for ovarian cancer. Okay. So uh, can you please elaborate on the precancerous changes that takes place in the woman that should be alarming and that should be taken care of? What are the changes? For ovarian cancer, what we know now is that the precancerous changes would seem to be in the fallopian tube. And therefore, for many of the ovarian cancers that kill women, in other words, the advanced type of ovarian cancer, is probably arising from the tubes. And over the last decade, we have recognized a precancerous change. How we are going to detect that remains to be seen. So we are at a new era in trying to figure out, is there a possibility somehow to uh, detect those precancerous changes and affect them? Until then, the only thing we've got to offer women who are at high risk is probably removal of the fallopian tubes at least. Okay, okay. Um, okay Professor, uh, as we know presently there are two staging systems for ovarian cancer. One mm -hmm. is done by FIGO and another is TNM staging. Mm -hmm. So which staging would you uh, advise to adopt or whatever is easy to adopt for the physicians? So we undertook a survey in the United Kingdom to see exactly where we would like to stay regarding the staging. We traditionally have used the FIGO staging and the consensus, the overwhelming consensus, was we would prefer to stay with that. 
It's not that there's anything wrong with the TNM. Uh, that is applicable and you can use it, but traditionally we've uh, used Vigo and probably because we are more familiar with it, our tendency is that we will stay with that for the foreseeable future. So it depends on the comfort level of the physician? I suppose that. it does to a certain extent. Some countries may find TNM, they've been using that for 20, 30 years yes. and they'll find they're comfortable with that. Okay. It's once the language is reasonably similar because all staging is all about is that we talk in the same language. Yeah. But traditionally, if you go to many places, FIGO is the staging system that's used around the world. Okay, Doctor, coming to your uh, CORUS trial uh, that you have uh, done uh, as a very wonderful research actually, can you please hear some light on the indications for opting the primary chemotherapy over primary surgery? What should be the indications? When so for that trial, you have to remember that in that study, these were women with an awful lot of disease burden, who a lot of them were elderly and not very, very fit. And what we were able to show that if you approach the management using primary surgery or the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that the outcome in regarding survival was the very same. So you still have both approaches. However, the side effects of treatment seem to be less on the neoadjuvant chemotherapy arm. And the more recent analysis that we haven't released or published as such would seem to indicate that possibly, or undoubtedly, with women with very with stage four disease, the neoadjuvant chemotherapeutic approach may give a better survival outcome. So it is probably for a select group of patients, but not every single patient with advanced ovarian cancer. And we're doing more work trying to stratify patients okay. who may well be better with one modality versus the other. Uh, but I think at the moment we are able to say, bringing the course and another European trial together, that stage four disease looks like it should be neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Okay, thank you. And you're actively involved in uh, research regarding ovarian cancer. What are the most promising advancement in the field of chemotherapeutics and surgical techniques? Uh, We've been, uh, at the moment, when this, if you take the surgery side of things, what we do know is that women who have all the disease removed seem to survive longer than those who don't have it all removed. So therefore there are quite a few gynae oncologists who are pushing to extend the operative procedures they do in selected patients. So if we did that across the world, we may see an advance. Having said that, we haven't got any randomized trials to prove that. These are all retrospective series. And in retrospective series, they are very useful to try and develop trials, but in themselves can't really dictate management. But I know there are people working very hard to try and do a study like CORUS, but with the more radical type surgery being involved. On the chemotherapeutic front, I can't say that we're quite stuck, but where we're going now is individualized therapy, so that the treatments in the future are going to be much more complicated, and they will probably be targeted therapies depending on what the tumor is like. So the future that will hold is that whilst the individual may have the ovarian or fallopian tube type cancer, you will actually take the tumor and then look at the molecular alterations or abnormalities within it and then target therapies to attack those pathways. So I think that's where we're, we're going to go. There's no amazing new blunderbuss chemotherapeutic agent out there, but there are quite a lot for your tackling tumours in different ways, such as anti-VEGF and yep. immunotherapy type strategies, which each are making sl small steps mm -hmm. in the management of the disease. What we have to do, though, is recognise the women where that's going to be very effective. Okay. And when you do that and stratify, then you will start seeing a major jump in some patients, okay. and then you can start looking at alternatives for those who do not do well on those agents. So it is going at immense pace, this individualised therapy or targeted therapy, and I think we should hold hope on that, albeit it may be a very expensive yeah. approach as well, of course. So according to you, the personalised medicine will be the future of the... I think there's little doubt that personalised medicine at the moment, at the pace it's going, will be the future. So we will probably have a mixture of therapies that we know work reasonably well on everybody combined with the personalised medicine as well. That needs to be sorted out. Okay, Professor Kio. Uh, we are a platform, online platform, professional network of doctors. So this kind of digital platform, do you think we have a role to play in updating and educating doctors through uh, like this kind of effort? I think the f with regards to kind of education nowadays, if you look at the next generation coming up, 
I would predict that besides uh, conferences, I think are very, very good way of getting information across. But there's no doubt the quickest way to access people nowadays via their phones or computers is through a digitalised mechanism. So I think we will see again a major increase and education wise even universities are doing them now where they will give courses that are done over the internet rather than actually formal lectures within a university. So I, I see this taking place as well just as much as individualised therapy. So yes, I think it's the way forward. Thank you Professor. You're very welcome. Yeah. Okay. To stay updated on our latest cable videos and interviews, please subscribe our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Happy Doc Plexing.